<clears throat> Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Tamar Andrews, and today I am so excited. I've got an amazing guest today, Pruna Richards, who is a fantastic leader in the field of early childhood education. She does professional development and consultations based out of her home state of Texas, but she has been all over the world, and uh, I'm just excited to uh, have you all listen to uh, words of wisdom from Perna. So Perna, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Tamra. This is a pleasure and an honor to join you. You are too kind. I am excited to be on this with you. There you go. So first of all, tell us what excites you about the field of early childhood. What gets you up in the morning? Um, so literally the field itself, knowing how important the first five years of life are and how much brain development happens and how big a role the grown-ups play in uh, laying a strong foundation so everybody can thrive. Um, I'm just very, very passionate about this field. And I, and I have to say that it feels like a calling to me. This is not a job. It's a calling. I'm on this planet Earth to make the world a better place for children, wherever I can, however I can. And um, that's what gets me excited in the morning, meeting educators that want to do their best and are open-minded and ready to try something new and different. So um, you touched on something. You want to make the world a better place. Um, we call that service leadership. 100%. You are, you know, in your, in your job, in the service of others. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk for a minute, if you will, about people who, um, like you and like myself, really went into this um, trying to make the world a better place, people who own or direct or in some way administer early childhood programs. What do you see as um, the big challenges right now for those that are either entering or already in the field of directing, directing or administering programs? You know, I think the biggest glaring one that we are all facing is shortage of good qualified candidates, finding them, retaining them, and it's very sad that our field doesn't pay as competitively and people are leaving. In fact, I was just literally talking to a director right before our call, and she's a lab school director. And she was sharing how, uh, you know, even students joining the courses of early childhood are going down. Um, and we have to do better. We, we have to raise the bar and make this a profession and not, I hate this word, babysitting we never sat on a baby like where did this word come from <laughs> that makes no sense to me you know um daycare is another word that gets under my skin I can't take that word I mean at least say child care you're taking care of the child so I think that's the biggest challenge that people face um you know I also support NAYC accreditation that's one of the things I do three things in my consulting service professional development which is brain-based brain science-based brain research-based I'm really passionate about that, that I don't want to talk about anything that's not good for the grown-up's brain or the children's brain. And my sweet spot, if you like, social, emotional, emotional intelligence, challenging behaviors, right? And a lot of the people are leaving the field because the stresses are high, the challenging behaviors are increasing and the burnout happens, right? And so that's a real fact we, we are facing. And the other thing I do is I'm a behavior coach. And the last thing I do is I'm a NACI consultant for accreditation. So supporting programs, re-accrediting, going through accreditation. And we were just talking about like this, I was saying with the lab school director, to have teachers who were part of the NACI accreditation in the past and how now have left and you've hired new people and you can't bring them up to speed and you can't teach them the developmentally appropriate practices. It is really taking a toll um, in, in programs across the country, I think. And I'm also a TRS assessor. So I'm also seeing it for the quality rating system for Texas. Um, just really struggling to find qualified people who you can find and keep because it directly impacts those brains that you're serving. And, and if you're in survival brain, there's not much you're doing for the little ones. Yeah, you know, you touched on, oh my gosh, so many things that are near and dear to me as well. One of the first things you said was, it's very challenging to find qualified teachers and they're not paid enough. So um, I keep telling people there is no shortage of teachers, actually. You can get anybody to do a job if you pay them enough, but we're just not paying them enough. And uh, as a professor, I have seen enrollment numbers uh, shifting downward in um, all the major universities here in Southern California. 
So let me ask you this then. Um, that is that is obviously a huge issue. Um, what do you think is a solution then to finding teachers who are qualified and paying them better? How, how, how can we fix that? Uh, it's not an easy solution. And I think we would be lying if we, we pretended like we had the solution in this conversation together. I think it's bigger than preschools and childcare centers on their own. I, I have a feeling that, you know, the states have to get involved and the states have to raise the minimum wage. The states have to provide resources to get your CDAs and trainings. I mean, as I go through schools, I see so many teachers getting their CDA online. You and I know that CDA is the first baby step. And if you're doing that online on your own, what are you really getting from it, right? It's convenience. It's a piece of paper, right? That gets you the yeah. stepping stone. So I, I really think this problem is bigger. And I think the pandemic showed us that we are critical workers and it is, a, it is an absolute critical field, but, but we haven't invested in it and we haven't supported it the way we need to, to sustain it. Uh, so it's bigger than just our conversation. Um, but I also want to sit in a hopeful space that, you know, if specific workforce boards get involved or the government gets involved and um, education for the grown-ups, higher pay rate, and really making the profession a profession yes. and raising the bar, right? Yes. You know, yesterday I was on a uh, webinar from the state of California about our proposed TK, we have a new uh, credential coming down the pipe. Uh, it's going to be called the PK or pre-K through third grade credential. So that teachers who work with the youngest kids in public schools will actually have some early childhood background. And one of the things discussed was, what do we call ourselves? Mm -hmm. And uh, we kind of unanimously voted on early care and education. I'm wondering if that would helped you know um, yeah um, i think early early childhood education would be my preference instead of care we do so much more than care we educate and we you know lay the foundation of brain um i have started calling early childhood educators brain architects yeah, and yeah, yeah, um, yeah. you know every time when i'm giving a training or having a conversation i want to remind the grown-ups that the work that they're doing is laying the foundation for those brains and you're touching kind of a life for the rest of the life because 90% of the brain is getting wired. So the human being they're going to become, you have had a part in it laying that foundation. And if you don't know enough about the brain, then you know you do the best that you know, but you do better when you know better. So early childhood education, um, uh, profession, you know, but yeah, care is a big part of it. Nurturing is a big part of it. <laughs> so then this is going to then touch on another question. You and I both speak the same language, architects of the young child's brain. We know what children need at this age. We know that play has to be an integral part of the way in which they learn. Why are we doing it so wrong? Why are we building TK programs where they sit on their tushies and learn academics all day? Why, why are we trying to push benchmarks and learning goals that require pen and paper on younger and younger children when we know how the brain actually learns, and what has been your experience in trying to shift administrators of early childhood programs and parents of young children to understand this? How do you get that done? Oh my goodness, that's a loaded question, right? Such a loaded question, and that's it, at the heart of it, right? The behaviors are happening because we're not respecting play. The behaviors are happening because we're not allowing children to move and play. So I have actually come up with an acronym now because I love acronyms. They help my brain to remember anything <laughs> getting older. <laughs> so SOS is what I'm calling it now, SOS. We expect children to sit still and the movements are limited. So sit on your pocket, sit on the shape, sit on the table, sit on the chair, sit, 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 sit. And you touched on that just now. And I think what the teachers are telling me, the ones that I coach, um, why they're doing it is because they feel like they can control the chaos. So if I can have you limited movement, so sit still. So I'll go back to my SOS before I go down this path. So <laughs> S is for sitting, being still, and the O is for obedience. Mm. The grown-ups are expecting nonstop obedience. So put your listening ears on. Did you hear what I said? Did you not listening to me? You're not listening. Like the obedience is like right up there. And the last S is be silent. So first Ooh. of all, be still. 
then be obedient and be silent. Wow, I love so, that acronym. Right, and so this SOS model is not working. This is a disaster. We have to change our mindset on this SOS. And I don't know- I love it because I'm gonna interrupt you because the SOS is really coming from the child. Like, please help me. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I think the, the behavior coaching that I do, this really goes to the heart of it, right? So we're limiting the movement of toys. Even yesterday I was doing a training and the teacher was like, putting that, oh, the folks belong in the home living, the, the folks don't come here, or this can't go there. So the toys can transport, kids can transport. This is not how brains are designed to learn. This is not- Young brains, young brains. Young brains, old brains, even grownups can't sit this long and they're expecting them to do it, right? It doesn't make any sense. If you're doing a webinar or a training, how many times people say that, oh, I've been sitting too long, I need to move. Hello, if you are doing that, what are you doing to the little ones? right? All day long, sit on your pocket, sit on the circle, sit, 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 and then be obedient. Put your listening ears on, click, click, dig, click. I'm like, what are we doing to kids? This We have to use the vocabulary, right? So I need your listening ears so you can pay attention and you can focus. So your brain can listen and learn. Let's tell them what we want them to do instead of just putting a lid on it. I don't know the answer to your question. Why officials in places where they can pass rules, make this happen. Early childhood is not watered down elementary. It has never worked. It'll never work. And, and why are we doing this? And we're ruining generations of kids who deserve the best start in life. And we're setting them up for failure because they their executive function skills are not happening. They're not problem solving. They can't focus. They can't pay attention. Memory is not happening. They can't have empathy and compassion. Like these are life skills that we need our children to have. Yeah, so, this SOS has got to go. This SOS. You know, has um, got to go. One of the things that I do is I travel around doing workshops in early childhood STEM, mm -hmm. and I always tell uh, teachers and directors, parents, we have to learn to future proof, because we're not raising children; we are raising future adults. That's right. And That's uh, exactly if you right. want to make a lot of money in twenty years, go into uh, psychotherapy because these kids will all be needing it. If and you know, it's and you and you touched on something really important. Um, it's so much more expensive to fix things later on than yes. it is to raise them right. <laughs> yes, you are absolutely correct. So, when you go into these early childhood programs, what do you find is the um, thing that you are helping directors and administrators with the most? What do you find is most successful in helping move them to a more developmentally appropriate program? Okay, so I'm so happy that you asked that. So just in this last year, uh, I worked with 35 schools and there was a common thread that was bubbling up. And what I realized was it starts from the inside out. So if we wanna hone in our teaching craft, it has to start from inside out. It has to start with recognizing what are my triggers. And I talk a lot about triggers and the teachers start with doing a homework on their triggers. What is stressing me out in my classroom? Who is stressing me out? And the whole self-regulation work starts. So, you know, self-regulation has three parts. What am I feeling? What caused it? And what can I do in the moment to help myself? So a lot of the work that I start with is recognizing why are you getting triggered? What is causing it? What can you help yourself with? I'll give you a very simple example of how this, this aha moment happened for a teacher that I was working with. Her classroom uh, was chaotic, it was hectic, it, it felt stressful, she was stressed out, and she was using her voice to control them. Oh. And she didn't know what else to do, right? She was doing yeah. the best she knew how. And this is not unusual. This is a common average problem that happens. Uh, when the adult gets stressed out, we use ways to control our environment so that we can have a sense of control. So this teacher was using her voice to control them and center time when it was free play time would be the one that she would get the most triggered. And so when I asked her to do this homework, I want you to identify what is your trigger. And the next week when I meet you, because these online coachings are once a week. And then she came back the next week and I said, okay, what did you learn about yourself? And she said, I realized that I was getting stressed out because I was so focused on my schedule. I was moving the kids along all day long. Hurry up, let's do this. Come on, get in line, sit down, do this. Come on, we gotta do this. 
like this pace was stressing her out. And I said, what did you do? I mean, that's a big aha. What did you do about it? And she said, I stopped looking at the clock. A simple change that she did for herself, she stopped looking at the clock. And she said, we got through the whole schedule, but I was calmer. And what I realized was my kids were not acting up as much, right? So that's the first thing that I do with the grownups that I'm working with. I'm calling them grownups because it doesn't matter your title. If you're a director, owner, teacher, assistant teacher, it doesn't matter. If you're stressed out, you are reacting and not responding. You are reacting and your brain is reacting and you're not responding. So that's the framework I start with. Get to know yourself, get to know your triggers, and then we take baby steps. And then once you know your triggers, what are you going to do in the moment? So you, you know the kids are going to get loud. That is happening. That is not going away. But what are you going to do the next time they get loud? What are you going to do the next time they ignore you? What are you going to do the next time they don't follow your instructions? Because these are the reasons people get triggered. You're not listening. You're being rude. Yeah. You're being defiant, right? So that's where it starts with. And then the other part is uh, we do a whole session on brain development. Ooh. The brain, brain science is important. Recognizing the three brain states. How do children and grown-ups show up when they're in their survival brain? How do they show up in their emotional brain? How do they show up in their in the learning brain? And then giving them very specific sentences. I call them sentences because they're magical sentence in the moment. So one being detective, what brain state is this child in right now? And what does this child need from me right now? And then giving them magical sentences to meet them, the brain state they're at. So that is part of it. And then we also start with the mindset that recognizing that behavior is a form of communication. Recognizing that the more I connect, the less I correct. So if all day long I'm doing correcting conversations, if all day long I'm doing behavior talk, I am not connecting with that human. The yeah, there's a study that shows that um, preschoolers hear anywhere from two to 600 commands barked at them a day. Ridiculous, right? Ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So yeah, the more we connect, the less we correct. And that's where we start changing the stress to joy. And I know you know this, that joy is an emotion of learning. Right? So when I'm joyful, I'm ready to learn. Yes. When I'm stressed out, I am not learning. We have to reduce the stress and replace it to joy so learning can happen. So yeah, these are the baby steps that we take. Um, I'll share with you two things that might help you. The first one is um, if you ever have teachers or programs where they have a time management issue, where they're always looking at the clock, there's a very old book called The Erosion of Childhood oh. by Valerie Polical. Um, and there is a chapter, it's broken up into chapters, vignettes of her observations of early childhood centers. And the chapter called the Golda Meir Nursery School is all about teachers who are always looking at the clock. And, you know, a little girl says, I'm hungry. And the teacher says, no, it's not hungry time right now. <laughs> um, doesn't notice the kids really immersed in block play and says it's cleanup time now. Yeah. And um, everything runs on the clock. And so yeah. if you have a group of people, it's nice to use that as a, um, you know, you send out that chapter, have them read it and um, then have like a, almost like a book club kind of thing. So I wrote the word erosion down and- Erosion of childhood. Erosion of childhood. By Valerie Polical. Um, and the other one is, uh, and this is just what I use in my PD, whenever I see teachers raising their voice, getting faster and louder, I tell them to remember low and slow. That's right. I've used that too. Low and slow. Yep. Yeah, um, I mean, slow and slow too. Yeah, low and slow. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> let me ask you this then. Um, those are teachers in the classrooms. Um, is this because directors are sending you into individual classrooms to help mentor teachers? So when I do behavior coaching, whether it's online or whether it's in person, it's usually because a director has reached out to me or an owner has reached out to me because they have increased behaviors happening in those classrooms and they don't know what else to do. And so it takes a team to get it fixed, right? Behavior is a form of communication. Behavior is a symptom. Behavior is not the cause. 
we have to chase the why, we have to sit in the wondering place, even the grown-up's behavior and the child's behavior. So if you really wanna make change, the director and the teacher, we work together. So after I do an observation, my debrief is in the director's office with the director present and the teacher right. present. Right. And then right. the homework is there and the accountability is there. And you know, I keep telling them the, another acronym, DSD. Yeah. Do yeah. something exactly. different. Exactly. Do something different. If, you, if you're not gonna do something different, then you're wasting your time and mine and we're not gonna be a good partner because you're calling me in to make some change, right? And so the other thing that we will talk about is play, respecting play. Right. right. And I quite often will see teachers hijacking play. Right. And <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Right. So we'll talk about that. And even just yesterday's school, I was in Richard R. Falls yesterday and, and the teacher literally was doing this. And I can't make stuff up like this. I literally can't make it up. She's sitting over here trying to have a board game happening with three boys. So she's facing this way with her three boys who want to play the memory game. Every five minutes, she keeps turning around because there's a blocks behind her and the dramatic behind her. And she keeps interjecting herself in the play. So she's like, she sees the guys in the block area have the fire trucks and she keeps like, the firemen are hungry. Are you going to cook them something? What are you going to cook me? Are you making me muffins? Is she like, by herself in the room? No, there's another teacher there. But, but I'm just like, you need to stop. You are hijacking the play. You have no idea what they're focusing on. And how about on. the boys at the table? Hello. And she keeps saying to the boy at the table, I'll be right there with you. Well, why? Be fully present. Just yeah. be where you are. Just be where your feet are. You don't have to control them. They weren't doing anything. But, but this is- You think she was trying to impress you with multitasking? Uh, could be or, or trying to show that she's connected and sees what the kids are doing. No, that's not connect. You're hijacking play. You're not yeah. respecting play. And, and the other thing her assistant kept doing was she would walk up to the dramatic play and she would sit herself down and she would say, what are you girls going to make for me? They weren't even thinking about you, lady. They weren't <laughs> even thinking. <laughs> they were in their own world. And so, you know, behaviors and play are connected. When there's SOS happening, when we are controlling the environment, we're not respecting play. I am not surprised you're having behaviors. So when I work with a school and a teacher and a program, we're doing mindset shift. We are bringing authentic play back. We're understanding where the child is coming from and which brain state they're in. And what is your role as the grown up? How are you supporting this right now? Yeah, my mom, my mom never interjected when my sisters and I were playing make believe. Same here. It's valuable. Yeah. It's sacred. You don't mess with play. Yeah, you yeah. Just don't hijack play. You respect play. Yeah, yeah. Or put yourself off a little ways away. And if the children invite you in, yes. then it's fine. Yes. Um, yes. Wow. Um, let me ask you, I'm going to go back to something else you said, increasing behavior issues. Um, do you find that they're, that you're seeing them as more organic uh, to the child or more a result and a product of the environment? So I'm so happy you asked this word, frame. So I'm going to start by saying that I actually hate this word, challenging behavior. And I know it's a strong word, hate, but I actually don't like it at all. Because here's the thing, there is no challenging behavior. It is a challenge for the grown-ups. I say the and same thing. Getting... <laughs> I say the same thing. The grown-ups are getting challenged and that's why it becomes a challenge, right? But it's happening because of the environment. It's ha happening because the grown-ups don't understand, don't listen, don't respect, don't slow down. And we're doing a lot of behavior talk. A lot of behavior talk. So I'll give you a real quick snippet between a difference between a behavior talk and a connect talk, because this also just happened yesterday. Look, my examples can only go by yesterday. I'm before After that, my brain is gone. So this happened yesterday. Um, <laughs> so this was part of the debrief that I did at the end of the day. So in this classroom, I'm just going to call this teacher Miss B. And she's in the pre-K pre classroom. And the free play starts and the center time opens up and this little girl i just call her abigail and abigail wants to do, use the dry erase board with the markers and the miss b i was so proud of her that she gave her agency and she allowed this child to move the dry erase board to the side and this girl is going at it and i'm sitting quite close to her and she says abigail says i'm making a porcupine urchin 
And so she's making a big circle and she's got all these pokes out and she's doing this to make the porcupine urchin, like very descriptive vocabulary. I can, you know, the, this effort is happening. And across the room is B shouts out, Abigail, don't do that with the markers. Remember the marker tip goes in. Remember we don't do that. And so Abigail is deep in play. And so this is happening. And so uh, she forgets and she picks up a different color and she does it again. So now we have black spots and white spots and the and red spots and this big circle with the, uh, the porcupines, pokey coming out everywhere. Like this girl is deep with her exploration, right? So she did that twice. And then um, at the debrief, I said to her, I said, so tell me more about what happened when she was drawing the porcupine urchin. Like I hadn't even heard of this vocabulary. It was pretty spectacular. And I said, what happened? You looked a little triggered and she started laughing. She said, oh my God, yeah, she doesn't listen. Oh my God, I have to tell her every day. And I'm like, so I would call that a behavior talk. Would you now like to know if you could change that to a connect talk? And she says, yeah, tell me more. And I said, okay, a behavior talk would sound like what you did across the room, stop it, put the cap back on, the marker's getting you in, la, 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 la. One of those 600 barked orders. There you go. And then a connect talk would be different. The connect talk would be you would walk up to her, you would get down on her level, and you would say to her, I notice you're very excited about drawing this. Tell me more what this is. And then remember- It's a porcupine urchin. Exactly. But she didn't hear that because she was over there and the girl was whispering. She didn't hear any of it. She just saw the action and she reacted to the action. And I said, and then a connect talk would be, tell me more about this. What is this? And she would have told you it was a porcupine urchin because I was sitting right next to her. So I heard that. And then you could have reminded her, remember the nips get ruined. So how can we do it? You know, I, I see you're very excited about it. So recognize the emotion that she's feeling. She was being curious. She was being imaginative. And she was deep in play and deep in work and figuring out this, right? And I was so happy that this teacher had the aha moment. And she's like, oh my God, what you're saying is don't talk at the kids, but talk with them. I'm like, yes, that's it. That's what I'm saying. Change from behavior to connect. And this week's homework, before I go back to see her, is she's going to practice more connect talks and less behavior talks. And I know if she does it well, we will see a change in her environment and we will right. see a change in her connecting to the kids. So that's the kind of deep work that I do. Wow. Um, I do have to say, we should do a, a genealogy tree because we seem to be very closely related. <laughs> um, the, the expression I usually use is connect and then redirect, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, first you have to connect uh -huh. with someone and then you can uh -huh. figure out the right way to redirect them. Um, before we run out of time, I want to ask you one last question. Um, you talked about the kids sitting on the rug and, um, you know, the teacher kind of trying to control the environment. I'm curious. We have... Um, Lakeshore, Kaplan, you know, uh, all of these early childhood material companies. And uh, I don't know how it is in Texas, but I know that in um, California, in order to be a teacher, in most child care centers, all you need are 12 units. You need oh, yeah. four, four classes. You could get a C in those classes. You don't have to be very good at it. And when you walk into your first day of school and you don't know what you're doing, you rely on the materials that these companies sell in right. order for you to kind of ascertain what it is that I'm going to be able to do. And you also spoke about the child's agency, um, as opposed to like the imperialism of the adults in the classroom. And these materials tend to keep the imperialistic adult and eliminate the agency of the child. Or for those of you that want a deeper explanation, it's the ability of the child to really be the protagonist. Mm -hmm in that environment. Um, have you walked into a lot of classrooms mm -hmm. where this, I mean, what do you do when just the physical environment mm -hmm. doesn't support the work that you mm -hmm. want to do? Yeah, we start with room arrangements. We start with, you know, all these furniture pieces, these heavy furniture pieces that cannot be moved by a child because they're part of the play. And, you know, uh, movable things or low things that, you know, that you can, uh, change and adapt. I mean, uh, one of the classrooms that I worked with, the biggest work was happening in the block area. And they had these big uh, 
uh, you know, the Lakeshore furniture pieces, the big shelving of- Golden then, rolls. We all yeah. bought them in the eighties. <laughs> oh, right. And so uh, the whole fight was happening in the block area. And I said to the teacher, I said, look, you have a choice to make. I don't, I'm not going to tell you how to rearrange your room, but I want you to think about creative ways, how you can rearrange this because so many battles, I'm calling them battles because they were literally battles in the block area. And, and you're going to just keep putting out fires unless you do something different. So I was very proud of her. The next week that I went, what I noticed was that she had moved her shelving around that gave the, the reason the fights was happening was the kids wanted to create these structures, but then as somebody would walk by, they would knock them over and then the whole thing would you know, get very chaotic. So what I was very proud of her, what she did was she rearranged it in such a way that it kind of quarantined it off with low shelving. So Ooh. she could still see for supervision, but she literally had to move her big heavy shelves, which normally the blocks have to something which manipulators have lower things. And she rearranged it and, um, very high scope. That's the high scope way. Exactly, of exactly. But you know, following the child's lead, and I think learning, because environment has to be your third teacher. But if the environment is a barrier, because it's only benefiting the imperial grown up yeah. to control the environment, because it's easy for her to manage, right? It's all about control, right? If I can just keep you alive and keep you safe, like, never mind the brain yeah. learning. My job is to just keep you alive and safe. I call it the lifeguard or the swim coach and you know analogy. You're just being a lifeguard because you're just scanning the room for safety. So anyway, she changed it. She allowed them more agency and freedom. And they she also allowed them to take prod, props from other parts of the room. And she also, the last thing she did with this was she allowed their structure to stay on for multiple days. Because oh, the way she had done it, they could come back the next right. day and add to their creation. It and protected. What, it protected that area. Exactly. Yes. So I'm so happy that you went to furniture that you know children can't move and can't do. But what she noticed was the behaviors went way down. And in fact, she had a class of 14. And out of the 14, eight of them got all engaged and full on for the wow. whole week in this block area, girls and boys. But then their problem solving and creativity went up to a whole new level. And of course, there's no behavior when the kids are engaged. Of course, there's no behavior. Yeah, I always say the adults can leave the room if yes. they've set it up correctly because the kids won't even notice. There you uh, go. Purna, I got to tell you, we, we're almost out of time. I, I'm hoping that you would be willing to do this again. I yeah. love listening to you talk. I, uh, I feel the have, same way about you, like kindred uh, spirits over here. <laughs> yeah, you have a way of explaining things that make it um, broken down into very simple elements, easy to digest. Um, it sounds like you are doing amazing work. I want to thank Playground um, for sponsoring this uh, webinar today. And I hope I see you again. Any last I, thing you want to tell us? Yes, thank you so much for this invite and thank you Playground for hosting this. Yes, and if anybody wants to reach out to me, my website is togetherwegrow.online and I have free resources there, Transforming Challenging Behaviors. There's um, free downloads, eBooks on attention and focus, on tantrums and meltdowns and all kinds of um, diversity because uh, I do a whole lot of work with diversity and uh, equity as well because you can't have equity if you don't have behaviors taken care of you know they, right. they bubble up right. too yes kind yes. of interchanges um yeah i would love to stay in connection with you and you know yeah. maybe come back and continue and thanks so much for the generous offer of uh free downloads and uh your website again is together we grow dot online online i know i wish it was dot org or dot com but it's dot no, online fine. together we grow dot online once um, you've got it on your uh browser just bookmark it that way you won't lose it there you and you'll go. know how to go back to Perno's website. And, and I'm also on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, if you want to connect through that, because I'm always sharing brain research. Ooh. Are you on LinkedIn platform. by chance? LinkedIn. Okay, uh, I'm going to go look for you on LinkedIn. Let's become friends over there. And I also have a YouTube channel with little five-minute clips on brain, uh, which were started over the pandemic uh, because people were asking me to repeat the same stuff. So I'm like, okay, let me make a video. It's not as as active as I would like it to be. <laughs> you got but it. Yeah. Uh, Thank well, you so okay, much. Now, now we're going to, you're going to, your viewership is going to rise exponentially. Thank you for saying that. And I, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to connect with you on this platform. Thanks. Thank you for the uh, invite. Thank you. All right, Benny, you there? <laughs>